Chapter 9 A Team Nicholas walked through one of Chaldea's many corridors, refraining from commenting on the repetitively minimalistic design since of the previous director. No wonder he keep asterisk asterisk at himself. He'd do it too if he had to live in this place for years on end, but he'd probably punch down one of the walls and escape. He glanced at Romani walking by his side with a clipboard and pursed his lips. There was something he needed to say to the doctor, but whether or not that was the right thing to do was up in the air. He considered the lazing and eccentric head of the medical apartment a friend. Sure, the guy spent most of his time lazing around aside from the master medical checks which he did himself, but he backed Nicholas up most of the time and talking to him was a good way to paw the time. Not to mention the stories that came from the man's travels around the world. Hey doc, what was that deal with Pepe? Knowing where I'm from? Nicholas asked curiously, easing into the conversation he wanted to have. I'm pretty sure I haven't given any information yet. Romani tilted his head before understanding flashed in his eyes. Oh yeah, I ran your blood, remember? We do need to make a proper report to the Mages Association and the UN even if the Wizard Marshal sent you here. I guess. It was times like these that made Nicholas regret not delving deeper into the works that made up Type Moon, but was it really his fault? He was the type to watch and read for passing enjoyment. Not to spend hours connecting dots and trying to understand just what the F asterisk CK he was looking at. How was he supposed to know he'd end up dropping into the universe after a short nap? Was this one of those things where a person took over a parallel version of themselves? Nicholas didn't know. He didn't much care at the moment either. By the way, it did help you out a ton, being a cowboy I mean. Romani waved around a metaphorical rope in the air, slightly smiling. The US is all too happy to have one of their own as a master. The clock tower can't touch you because of the wizard marshal. And well, I tampered a bit with the information, your origins don't matter. Chaldea, humanity needs people like you. Nicholas scratched the back of his head. Got you, doc. There's something else too. Ask away. The doctor encouraged the teenager, before greeting one of the passing staff members and returning his attention to Nicholas. About Maji Marie. Nicholas averted his gaze, avoiding Romani's serene smile. It might be a hot chick. I'm sorry about what happened last time. The guy was helping him out so much. It wasn't in Nicholas' code to be an asshole to him. It's fine. What? It's fine, Nicholas. It doesn't matter. Nicholas took a step away from Romani, staring at him in alarm. What do you mean? It doesn't matter. It matters more than anything. He didn't know why, but the doctor's wise and sagely smile was deeply unsettling. After spending the night crying about false, banal concepts. I came to see the truth. Romani held up a fist, extremely determined. It doesn't matter if Magi Mari is a man or a woman. It's Magi Mari to me. Nicholas looked down at his trembling hands as his eyes slowly lost their light. W. What have I done? You help me see the truth? Romani patted his shoulder, smiling brightly. Thank you. That bright smile, those shining eyes, were the most terrifying F asterisk king things Nicholas had seen since his arrival. Nicholas tapped his fingers on the metal table he was sitting at, trying to push away his encounter with Dr. Roman earlier during the day. So why are we here? The two people that sat across from him were stark reminders of just why this world was considered so F asterisk kept up by many people. The blonde Kirshteria Wodime was one of the best magi in the world. For that, his own father tried to have him key asterisk asterisk ed cause he outdid the useless retard and then his savior, a stray orphan who nursed him back to health from death's door, died of malnutrition and injury because someone beat the shit out of a kid for stealing a loaf of bread, so that he could give it to the injured Kirshteria. The end result was his magic circuits, something that was extremely important for standing as a magus as he'd come to learn, being crippled. The Bada son of a bit asterisk H still went on to become one of the greatest magi in the world, all while keeping a gentle and compassionate heart. Nicholas' gaze then moved to his assistant, Ophelia Famersalone, a girl that was tortured and experimented on by her own parents throughout her own childhood to make her better, destroying her confidence and making her a traumatized recluse for fear of being abandoned and hurt again. Romani had told him all this and Nicholas didn't really doubt the man. He didn't seem like the type to do that. Be gut. Kirshteria started, 
disarmingly placing both hands on the table between them. I had decided I would place my trust in him. He held up a hand to placate Ophelia who'd opened her mouth and Nicholas who'd all but leapt across the table to murk him. But, his actions with you, his previous history, have made me realize it was merely my foolish wish to trust him as a comrade despite my better judgment, that even he could change. Nicholas tilted his head. Shouldn't you be angry with me then? It didn't take a genius to figure out he was referring to the first part of what the leader of the A-team had said. Logically, yes. Kirshteria closed his eyes and inhaled before continuing coolly. He tried to attack Miss Mash again, perhaps knowing that you would attack him once you learn of his awakening. Ophelia nodded her head in silent agreement when the metal creaked and bent under Nicholas' grip. I can see why no one told me. He didn't like that, at all. He'd seen the innocent girl going about her day on several occasions. What the hell had the withdrawn and poor Marshmallow done to deserve that? He deserved it. Nicholas heard Ophelia speak clearly for the first time. He was a twisted man with no excuse for his actions. Scandavia Pepperoncino has personally attested to your strength. Your ray shift compatibility and personal combat prowess exceeds barrels, and I wish to tell you I agree with the director's decision to assign you to the A-team. That was what he'd been called here for, though many of the nobility will disagree. It was no secret that most of the Chaldean masters were nobility from the Magus world. It made sense considering one's lineage directly influenced their talent and compatibility, but there were always exceptions. I will deal with them as your leader. Man, you're way damn cooler than I thought you'd be. Nicholas relaxed back into his chair. I had you pegged for an upstuck as... You did? Is my behavior not merely what I must do? The A-team leader asked calmly, displaying no emotion on his face. Nicholas deadpanned, genuinely wondering whether Kirshteria was F asterisk king with him. My last boss was a lazy asshole that just gave his work to us and threatened to fire us if we didn't do it. I trust you reported him? I punched him. You did? Is that what you're meant to do? Not report. Of course you punch the guy that abuses his authority. Nicholas smiled as much as his frozen face allowed him and held up a balled up fist. You are? I see. Ophelia, standing behind Kirshteria, pursed her lips and forced herself not to face bomb. I understand now why you keep punching Professor Leviticus, mostly because she knew Kirshteria Wodime, the magus genius of the century, was taking all the new master's words at face value. Hey, I'm beginning to like you more and more. Also because she knew full well the new master meant every single one of his words too. That is good. Ophelia Famersalone was left at a loss for words at the sheer lack of cunning both men displayed. Chapter 10 Temporary Compromise His eyes burning in concentration, sweat rolling down his forehead, and every single muscle in his system scrunched. Nicholas eyeballed the laptop sitting on his table. His concentration was at a level none at Chaldea had witnessed before, his state one they didn't know existed. That was why no one in the cafeteria asked why he was watching a Magi Mari stream like his life depended on it. Oh yeah, there was also the form he'd been told to fill out lying near him. He had to do this. Nicholas had to fully know what Magi Mari was. It didn't matter that he was missing a medical checkup. It didn't matter that the inventor, Shaun Eltnam Sakaris, of the Trismegistus system used by Chaldea as the core for ray shifting AK, time traveling, was staring him down with her hands on her hips. He didn't know that so for all he cared, it was a chick with her screws loose, there were a lot of those around here. Is it really that important? She tilted her head in confusion, leaning down closer to him as her uniform jiggled from the movement. Why won't you lead me down to Trismegistus? Leave me alone, woman. Go mess with someone else. Eh, hey, so you'd ignore me for a virtual idol? That's a first, sorta of pathetic. Shaun tossed aside one of her long purple twin tails and fixed her glasses. A nerd? Bah, please. I know I'm a genius, but not a nerd. Wait, depending on the meaning, I guess I might be one. Nicholas deadpanned, raising his head to look at her for a moment. You're annoying, piss off. This is the first time someone's been so rude. I won't Leah dash. Lady, I think you should dash. Bill, for his part, tried to warn her. This was more warnings than he'd seen most people get. 
and he knew full well the sort of attitude and hesitation Nicholas had when it came to punching the opposite gender. And just about as he'd expected, a fist smashed into the girl's face, knocking her through the air and into the metal wall. The older man could only sigh at what had occurred. Anyone that had spent over a month with Nicholas Martel, no, a single day, would know how quick he was to punch what he found annoying. The genius inventor of a literal time travel system slid down the wall, her limp body coming to rest in a sitting position, her head hanging forward. Whoa, you actually punched me. When the director warned me, I didn't believe it. Nicholas raised a brow, intrigued. That doesn't happen a lot. The few times someone had managed to tank a punch from him, even if it was a light one, they weren't human. There was definitely a pattern there. The girl's frail body jerked and she spit a mouthful of blood before turning to look at him with a massive smile. You punch really hard, don't you? And a lady too. Isn't that supposed to be wrong? Aren't you ashamed? Are you one of those true ancestors? He threw a wild guess, recalling them to be something like you. Tota. Shaun put both her hands over her mouth, cutting herself off. And nope. What makes you think I'm a vampire? I'm just cool like this. Wait. You see through the illusion? Nicholas deadpanned more than he physically could. I never said you were a vampire. The teenager gave the genius inventor a thumbs up. Great going. Shaun drew conclusions of her own. As a genius, there was no way for her to be fooled into revealing one of her cards by mishap. So yes, she realized in 0.01 seconds just what kind of person she was dealing with here. I see. I see. The purple-haired girl stroked her chin and nodded her head several times. You're one of those, huh? So that's how it is. To think you would actually appear in Chaldea? He was one of those extremely smart masterminds who acted dumb and stupid to throw people off while plotting all sorts of shit. Shaun was onto him now. She hemphed and pointed a finger at the oblivious teenager. I'll be back after I lay the finishing touches on Trismegistus, or your boss will really have my behind. They had had the system fully installed a few months ago. She was here to work out quirks and note any shortcomings in its processes, but who knew she'd find something so interesting? Besides, where else would she find a person who talked to her so freely? Like friends would? The not vampire waved him goodbye and took her leave. It's like everyone I meet is F asterisk ket up in some way. Nicholas shrugged and returned to his work, but not before glancing at Bill. How's Randy? We got him completely healed, don't worry about it. Also, I agree with you refusing to wear the standard uniform. A loud voice echoed from the hallway. It's functional but the design is just non-non. Don't tell anyone I was here, Kay. It's a secret. Nicholas and Bill exchanged glances before nodding at each other. Nothing happened. The higher-ups of Chaldea were weird as hell. Who even was that? Beats me. And so... Nicholas unknowingly made a friend of the immortal inventor of Trismegistus and representative of the Atlas Research Institute, whose science could fell the gods themselves. A representative whose temporary presence in Chaldea was supposed to be privy to only the director. The pale-haired teenager looked back at his laptop, finding a note taped to the screen and curiously took it off. What it said managed to genuinely confuse him. If you meet an alien, Punch it as hard as you can without holding back even a bit if you want to save your friends. Fate had aliens? Nicholas stared out at the vast expanse of snow from one of the corridors, arms crossed as he nodded his head in appreciation. The temperatures out there were enough to freeze any living creature within seconds, ranging from minus 49 degrees to minus 83 degrees, maybe colder but here he was, wearing nothing but a plain navy t-shirt and black jeans, feeling nothing but room temperature. But then again, that was how he'd felt outside too so his word wasn't something the normal people could go off. A stark difference from fields of gras, crops, and grazing animals, is it not? Nicholas didn't need to look back to know it was Lev Laner Floros who was talking to him. What you want? Chuckluff asterisk CK? A truce. He heard the man chuckle. I have come to realize it is counterproductive to risk ruining all the careful effort we had to put in for this plan of ours to remove a simple disconcerting variable out of personal motivations. At that, even Nicholas had to turn around with eyes narrowed. I like your fancy words magic man but I don't get even a bit of what you just said. Of course you don't. The professor face-bombed with the one hand that wasn't in a cast. 
I'm saying we should stop working against each other until our mission succeeds. I will no longer attempt to have you removed. In exchange, you should stop harassing me like a child. That was fishy as F asterisk CK. Nicholas had dealt with sneaky bit asterisk he's like Lev before. This was just a ploy to get his guard down. You also stay away from Olga? Done. Lev grinned and held out a hand only for Nicholas to look at it with disgust in his eyes. I'd spit on it, but even that'd be a waste. Lev shook his head, visibly disappointed. A child? I swear, a child. He gave a small bow and left quickly. Kids are menaces. Nicholas took the jab as a compliment. The lore explanation for Shaun visiting Chaldea, even though she came in much later on, is pretty much as stated in the chapter. The Trismegistus system was finished and installed in 2015. FGO starts somewhere between 2015 to 2016, and I can't recall any official dates. It's logical to presume the system's creator would check up on it somewhere in between. More so because she was recognized when she made her official entry later on. She's using an illusion to hide her features, but Nicholas saw them all along. He also knew Magi Mari was a dude even though Merlin uses an illusion. In the spirit of Ritsuka Fujimara being immune to poison, Nicholas also has a passive ability besides punching shit. What do you think it is? Chapter 11 Chaldea's Mascot Have you read A Song of Ice and Fire? Nicholas asked curiously, observing the book lying in Yu's lap. It had a Japanese title, so obviously he couldn't make heads or tails of what it said. It'd be different if someone showed him the alphabet, but no one did. So he only knew how to speak it slightly and even that because of some bits spoken by other staff members. Hainak Akuta, you, looked up to meet his shining violet eyes, but couldn't hold eye contact and averted her gaze. What's that? She was startled by him gasping like a deer that had been shot. Percy Jackson? This time, you didn't even respond. She only tilted her head in confusion. All right, all right. Stephen King? Nicholas was looking at her with so much disappointment, even he found it strange. Yes. The eccentric new member of a team let out a relieved sigh, a hand over his chest. You had me scared there for a second. Every time he posseed by her, the would dash asterisk a him, asterisk hag dash asterisk a him, asterisk woman was reading a book. She put it down when near him, but still, check out the ones I mentioned. Got it. You allowed herself to slightly smile, satisfied with the shared interest, but at the same time found herself taking a page from his book. You should try Magecraft for Toddlers. Nicholas rubbed his chin in thought before nodding profoundly. I'll do that. It was hard not to notice after over a month here. Magecraft was convenient in a lot of ways, and he wasn't averse to learning a trick or two to paw the time. There isn't an actual book by that name. You face bombed, sighing. I swear to God you're too dumb dash. The Chinese immortal clenched her fist in annoyance when she noticed the smirk on the teenager's face. She'd been had again. Gore. You rose to her feet, dusting her clothes with her hands. I just remembered something I need to do. What do you even mean by that? All we gotta do around here is laze around or train or something. I don't have to tell yo dash. She winced remembering his lack of hesitation when it came to punching her and explained in a lower tone. It's something personal. Nicholas could only chortle at her sudden change. I wasn't going to punch you, you know. I don't hit friends. Unless they're being retarded, then it's free game. He nodded sagely speaking the greatest piece of wisdom available to him. F friends. You whispered to herself, I, I'll see you later. She scurried down the corridor and exited into another before he could say anything more. Nicholas shrugged and walked away, onto the next person that caught his eye. Chaldea had a lot of eccentric personalities. Nicholas' walk brought him to the medical bay. The other masters had been busy with their own stuff. Well, other than the ones he temporarily put out of commission because they were trying to order him around. Magi nobility are weird as hell. The A-team were like black sheep, considering how elitist and upstuck the rest of the nobility-related masters were. It wasn't even them being blatantly arrogant or antagonistic, just that they seemed to be hardwired into genuinely believing that anyone that wasn't a magus of ancient lineage was just inferior. Though, as always, a punch to the face seemed to change their opinions damn near instantly. I would agree, but there's a whole faction related to how they shouldn't prioritize blood and name, but merit instead. 
Romani answered him from behind a green curtain. You'd know that if you visited the clock tower. I can do that? You could ask the director for permission. It's been weeks, and she hasn't put through my request to test the servant system. I'm not going to talk to her anymore. Nicholas answered like a child, you didn't give that favorite game you promised you would. I thought we were brothers. I'm not even going to talk about how that's just fundamentally wrong. He could hear the doctor chuckling from behind the curtain. Aren't you curious about the ones that don't care that you're a civilian? Nicholas straddled a chair, biting into an apple he to him stolen from Lou Dash asterisk a him asterisk picked up somewhere along the way. Sure, go ahead. Spend an hour of your life explaining how there are and aren't assholes everywhere in the world. Oh no, I have to check up on one of the new masters. Romani pulled aside the curtains before moving to a stool in the middle and withdrawing a needle from a familiar lavender-haired girl. He put either hand on the withdrawn girl's shoulders and grinned cheekily. But young Mash here can do that. She was just telling me about how it was wrong that you talked and got along with everyone, but her even though you got into a fight with Beryl. I know that there. Mash embarrassedly lowered her head when she noticed Nicholas eyeballing her like every person he met, scratching her flustered cheek. I, erm. Nicholas tilted his head in confusion. If she don't mind, sure. The teenager shrugged, unaware or uncaring of Mash's embarrassment. As I thought. Romani nodded and hurried over to Nicholas before whispering in his ear. Be nice to her. She doesn't have any friends. The head of Chaldea's medical department had long grasped just what kind of person Nicholas Martel was. There was no way to change his mind or placate him. One could only appeal to his mindset and pick up the pieces after the storm passate. The Democratic faction is led by the Trambilio family under Lord MacDonald. Oh, that's the group the doctor was referring to, the group that cares about merit above all. Mash explained with a small smile on her face, happy that even she could help someone in her current state. More so because everyone at Chaldea was so outstanding that she felt she couldn't compare at all. The only reason she'd been put on the A-team was because she had functioned as a catalyst for summoning heroic spirits. I think. They'd pick you up immediately if you made contact with them. Even Nicholas Martel, the newest member of the A-team, the one she was talking to right now was absurdly outstanding. From what she'd heard, he'd assaulted Barrel Gut and crippled him permanently and well, it wasn't right, but she didn't feel bad about him after what he'd done to her. Furthermore, Dr. Roman had told her that he could actively participate in servant battles with raw power. Was it really that strange she felt she couldn't compare at all? Actually, with the way he was silently staring at her, he probably agra. That's a smile I can appreciate. Eh, I mean, all the times I seen you before, you smiled like a person that's given up. Nicholas quickly explained himself, sipping on his coffee. Ash, ow. Nicholas deadpanned at her question. So much so that even she thought it was a stupid question. I just touch Gra regularly. His answer just confused her even more. Anyway, carry on. Tell me more about the assholes. Ah, yes. You mean the aristocratic faction, right? Mash was thankful he didn't leave her alone with her current thoughts and glad that studying up and asking around was helpful in some way. Well, they're the ones who would try to remove you. Their leader is the Barthemiloy family, under Lady Lorelei Barthemiloy. I see. I see. Got it. Nicholas nodded along, fully paying attention to her words. There's also gotta be the guys that just don't give a shit. The neutral faction, under the Meluastia of Lord Carmaglyph Meluastia de Luc. He is usually withdrawn and keeps to himself. Of course what she knew was just what she'd heard from other staff. He might be different if you actually meet him. Man, I almost thought you were saying a spell with that name. His parents really hated his as, huh? Mash didn't understand the slight giggle that escaped her mouth, but she could see how some of the names resembled spell chants. It was nice to talk to someone who eagerly paid attention to her and found her words to be genuinely useful. Chapter 12 Yank vs. London The sun hid behind the clouds and a certain gloom hung about the brick and stone city of London. Mist rolled into the streets and with each breath, a cloud of condensation joined with the air. This was good. It hid the machinations of the Mages Association that had its headquarters in the city from the blissfully unaware public. All right, enough about the senile, elitist codgers that spent their time diddling to books, blissfully unaware 
of just how f asterisk ked they were if science kept progressing the way it was. Caddox Olympus rubbed his hands together and breathed into them as he watched a pale-haired teenager with dead eyes help an old woman across the road, through traffic, with a small smile on his face. The only problem was said teenager didn't care enough to look around at incoming traffic, and the speeding black van headed right for them even though the signal explicitly said not to do so. Nicholas. Caddox tried to warn him, but it was too late. Was this it? Was his new friend going to become a splatter on the road? Of course not. Who did these people think they were dealing with? You blind? Nicholas turned around faster than he had any right to and slammed a balled-up fist into the vehicle's hood. A massive clang echoed throughout the mostly empty street, followed by a boom and a hoot as the teenager yanked out a piece of the engine. Caddock pursed his lips before sighing and hurrying over to his fellow master. I don't think I should, but... Are you all right? He should have seen it coming. But well... Normal people didn't just punch cars and get to walk away without any injuries. They were here in London because the director had some business at the clock tower and Nicholas threatened to maim someone if he wasn't allowed to go outside. It was a good opportunity so the director took them with her, assigning Caddock to babysit the child and make sure he didn't cause trouble. Caddock didn't know why Olga Marie Anamusfier hadn't assigned Hanako even though she seemed willing but well, it was all good. He got to hang out with his bro. I'm cool. Check on Granny. Nicholas glanced over his shoulder at the woman, who was yet to understand what they were doing. Kadok nadi din valentereli. Sur what no? We were told to not cause a ruckus. The young master nervously looked around at the small crowd. All these people are staring at us now. He could see some of them reaching for their phones. To make matters worse, the door of the van was kicked open and a man dressed in jeans and a puffy jacket blew his gasket kicking open the door and staring at Nicholas from under a dark ski mask. Oi, bruv. What the fuck you think you're doing? Hey, Caddock, do you know what he's saying? The accent was too thick for Nicholas to make heads or tails of what the man was shouting. Caddock slowly nodded. Um. You were the one speed dash. You want to get clipped, boy? Caddock looked back at the oblivious Nicholas for help. It was you, dash. Get out, air, lads. Caddock could only purse his lips and watch in silence as the back doors of the van were thrown open and nearly half a dozen more men burst out, dressed like each other but with a little variation in color here and there. Now, cough up the damage. Caddock closed his eyes to stop spit from going in them. Nicholas, standing behind him, finally understood what was going on when one pulled a knife out of his pants. He put a hand on the teenager's shoulder and gave him a silent nod before lightly shoving him behind and walking to the front as he took off his purple jacket. Boys, I'll speak this in a way you get it. Hot chicks like Olga would sometimes get warnings if he was feeling gracious enough. Dumb F asterisk CKs like these wannabe gangster would get railed. Now, Nicholas inhaled deeply before a slight smirk crept onto his lips. Sorry, that's right, Dash. No habbles, dumb F asterisk CK. Would dash. Think fast chuckle nuts. Nicholas threw a left hook at the man's face, flinging him through the air as many looked on with eyes wide in shock. He jammed his foot up another one's family jewels. Anyone who's stupid enough to F asterisk CK you is gonna thank me later. Get him. He ain't gonna be so bloody tough with a knife up his fanny. Caddock was brought out of his stupor by a gloved fist making way for his pale cheeks. He hastily moved his head to the side, stumbling over his feet and proving just why he wasn't noted to be particularly gifted when it came to physical prowess when he almost backed into the old lady who had indirectly started the whole encounter. Ye e. To his shock, the older woman swirled her purse and smashed into his assailant's prize jewels. Runts, these stupid lot think they're amazing because they can stab people. She pinched Caddock's cheek with a big smile. They should be like you nice young men. Not many blokes rush to help their mates like you did. Even if... The granny looked at Nicholas with pursed lips like Caddock's own. Well, he didn't really need the help. The teenager in question was dusting his hands, having just bashed someone's head into the van. Don't start fights you can't win. Caddock thanked the woman and ran over to his friend with a small smile, visibly happy with her compliment. We should leave before the police get here. I don't T-dash. The small crowd parted as two taller men in uniform approached. They looked at Nicholas and Caddock who was trying to get him to run. 
then at the masked men lying on the ground unconscious and bloody with knives and daggers around them. Of course it's bloody yanks. The obvious conclusion here was either was an altercation between two rival parties, or two teenagers had been attacked. Unfortunately, it didn't matter. For this wasn't a world where you could beat the ever-living shit out of your attacker and walk away scot-free if the damage you did was more than what was done to you. Also because cops weren't nice most of the time. Alright Jim, take the shits in. Scratch that. Most of them were shitheads. Now, the normal thing to do for a common man was to be as non-threatening as possible and calmly explain the situation in a station even if it was technically wrong for the victim to be the one harassed. The normal thing to do for a magus was just mind f asterisk ck the whole crowd into oblivion and leave the scene. Nicholas, no. Try me, bit asterisk h. Unfortunately for the cops, Nicholas wasn't a normal man or a normal magus. Olga Marie and Amusfier sat at a bench outside the British Museum, massaging her forehead. The clock tower was supposed to be a welcoming place for all to learn and thrive. It was actually just a place with elitist, discriminatory assholes to do as they wanted. The lords that watched over it were just as much a pain to deal with. The ones that would spit on your face were actually easier to deal with compared to the ones who were all smiles. Before she could mull over various possible shortcomings regarding her visit and the first mission Chaldea was to undertake, Olga was drawn to one of the staff that came along hectically rushing her way, out of breath and haggard, with a phone in his hand. The fat man came to a flimsy stop near her and went to his knees. D. Director. I. It's Kadok. He held out the phone to her. It couldn't be what she already knew it was, right? Olga's eyes dampened in defeat as she put the device to her ear and then opened wide in shock when sirens blared over it. D. Director. Is that you? What did he do? The woman deadpanned. He got attacked. What? That was hard to believe. By some. Men in masks? Then the police came and tried to arrest us. The young man spoke hurriedly. Olga narrowed her eyes. I trust you let them do it? They could just alter the memories of the officers and be done with the ordeal without any commotion, but of course, this was Nicholas they were talking about. He didn't attack them, right? He did. A vein popped out on her forehead as she raised a fist, gritting her teeth. She'd heard wrong. That was it. It had to be. Right? Please? Olga Marie Anamusphere wasn't really a woman of God but right now, she wanted to pray to everything out there. Come again. He did. He attacked the police. Where are you right now? Olga face bombed hard enough that even Kadok heard it and then dragged her hand down her face. In some cafeteria, over at East Lawn Dash. Nicholas, no. Don't. Come on man, let's just run away. The director of Chaldea forced herself to calm down and considered her options. You have a cloaking spell? Use it and tell him he can use the fate system if he just leaves. The Animusphere were one of the twelve lords that held dominion over the clock tower and by extension, the mages association and the supernatural world. It was easy to have an incident removed for Lord Animusphere. She would send some people over to deal with the aftermath. Olga wanted to hope the damages weren't too much but she knew better. Director. Nicholas just threw an APC at the riot police. How is there a riot? The granny was part of some group or association. I don't really get it. I'll put it on speaker. What granny? Olga didn't even care about the magi staring at her right now. Death to the oppressors. Too long have we suffered the police. What in the hell was going on out there? To be honest, she didn't even want to know. Chapter 13. Harsh Director. This is abuse. I'm sending a complaint to HR. Knowing Nicholas, that was probably going to come in the form of assault with full intent to cause bodily harm. I'm the director. You can't complain about me. Olga Marie Animusphere narrowed her eyes at the grumbling pale-haired teenager. Who would it even go to? There was no higher authority to report to beyond her. Nicholas mimicked her expression, resting his back against the cold metal of the vehicle taking them through Antarctica at speeds greater than it had any right to be moving at being the hulking moss it was. Court. Clock tower? You really want to take a matter to the clock tower? Most trials there were charades for the sake of appearances, their rulings predetermined by the one with the bigger political D asterisk CK, against a member of the Twelve Lords? A commoner civilian with no background, 
would lose the trial for nothing other than the deciding members wanting to curry her favor. Also, you threw an APC at the riot police, burnt down a police station, caused who knows how much property damage. Olga deadpanned at Nicholas, folding her arms under her chest and involuntarily drawing the teenager's gaze to them. I'm not even going to mention the possible enemy you've made out of one of the most influential gangs in the city and how much it cost me to deal with it. You think I enjoy altering people's memories? Why? Yeah, Nicholas, I think you should accept the punishment. Kadok spoke from a dark corner making Olga and Nicholas turn his way in alarm. Did you guys forget I was here? He sighed and retreated into the shadows, in a fully lit automobile, somehow. I thought you was sleeping. To know about her, though, Nicholas whispered, offhandedly pointing at a stupefied Olga. Is it just me, or is she way too calm? Kadok leaned forward slightly, expertly avoiding the woman's gaze with ski asterisk asterisk honed over years of having no friends and no Leah him. Now that you mention it, the director's usually explosive, like a mine, to the point where no one wanted to stay near her for prolonged periods of time out of fear of being chewed up raw and then spit out then stomped on. Olga finally seemed to regain her senses and fumed at their discussion. I am not. She was nice, right? True, she may have thrown her files in someone's face that one time, but that was because of their own incompetence. Bill told me you tore up someone's report in their face. Nicholas rubbed his chin in thought, staring at the ceiling. Randy told me he had to beg you for his vacation because he was a bit behind? Olga's expression faltered. There was no way a genius like her couldn't remember incidents, once reminded. I, it was true. The report looked like a toddler wrote it. Olga tried to excuse her actions. So if a toddler wrote it, you'd tear up the work. Why would there be a toddler at Chaldea? Good point, Kadok. Nicholas shamelessly retracted his analogy and mentioned another. So if it was someone's first day at work, you'd punish them fo dash. But it wasn't his first day. Who would make a report on the first day? Kadok spoke out again with a small smile. The Basta Asterisk D was enjoying it. Most of the staff has been working there for years. Nicholas eyeballed his friend. Busky Asterisk Asterisk. Olga ignored the two man children and contemplated whether her reputation was deserved. Wait, I've got it. Nicholas smiled in triumph. You ordered that I should be thrown out the first day I arrived. And you just lied about letting me use the servant system to cull righteous rebellion. For the first time in a long time, the director of Chaldea was left dumbfounded. W. She tilted her head and recoiled physically. I did what? Who told you that? Why would I dash? Did they really think she was the sort of monster who would throw someone out to die in minus 80 degrees? Did even Nicholas believe that? Needless to say, the teenager didn't believe Jack's hit. He was just an ashole sometimes. My God. If that was true, then she really was an ashole. Lev did. Nicholas threw the problem at Lev. He came to me after our truce. I would never do something like that. Olga pinched the bridge of her nose. She wanted to cry. Why would I do something like that to you of all people? He was the first one to acknowledge her. She even covered all the damages he incurred in London. You. You messed up, Nicholas. Kadok scratched the back of his head. This is too far. The director is about to cry, again? Yeah. Nicholas agreed completely. The staff of Chaldea that welcomed their director back in the vehicle bay didn't know why she pushed them aside and ran away, but it all made sense when Nicholas walked out of the door with Kadok behind him. No really wanted to ask him for details after he punched one of the support beams, and it crumpled under the strike. He was also in a less than agreeable mood. Nicholas found Olga hiding in her office, behind her table to be specific, with a cup of coffee and a box of tissues. She was all curled up, hiding her face in her knees with her back to the table. Yodi. Olga, what you up to? He spoke casually, waving his hand as the metal door slid aside, but received no answer, only soft whimpering and sneezing. I guess you don't want to talk to me. He didn't like making people who weren't assholes cry. It was free game for people like Lev though. Anyway, this was the second time he'd done it now. Sighing, Nicholas walked over to the lights and flipped them on before walking over to her aquarium. Did I tell you you have some coolest fish? Seriously, there was one with whiskers like a Chinese elder. 
You did last time. He knew the woman that softly answered his question was anything but an asshole. She spent most of her time working while also making sure her staff had no problems. She even covered where they came up short in secrecy. He hadn't really met anyone as hardworking as her, nor as sensitive to his words. Most people thought he was nuts. Hell, you're cool as shit for not going off to the deep end. Usually, when you grew up without approval or recognition for painstaking efforts, you were a hateful, reclusive little shit that thought the world owed you something and gave up. He'd seen the exact opposite of that in his time here. Nicholas walked to her table with slow, careful steps and leaned against it with one hand. I can see why you'd want to cry. Lev, I was prepared for him to do something aft, after what you told me. Well, she wasn't dumb enough to not be able to connect those dots. But I didn't think you'd believe him. I, I didn't think he'd be right. She just didn't want to believe someone who had been there would stab her in the back. Oh, come on. You're not an asshole. I was kidding around. Nicholas knew he was built differ dash asterisk a him, asterisk that everyone couldn't deal with their problems by punching them. I didn't believe what he said either. He's a snake. The mother asterisk cur even wore green while dressing like an 18th century Brit. You didn't? Olga stared up at him with bright golden eyes. Cause? I would never dash. She was cut off by Nicholas flicking her forehead. You take my stuff way too seriously. I know you wouldn't. Nicholas found himself with a small smile on his usually frozen face. Even I see how you try to look after the staff. You ask them if they eat enough. Haven't seen a boss like that ever. Well, she did shout about how they were kids that didn't know what to eat, but that was just how hasty she was. So, so I'm not in his dash. She was hesitant to say the word, Ashol? To know about that. Nicholas raised his hands in surrender when tears started welling up in his boss eyes. You're not an asshole. I'll make sure the staff know that you aren't one. Why you will? Yeah. I mean, Nicholas scratched his cheek. You're the first person I wouldn't want to punch. Olga Marie Anna Musfier could never know just how literal those words were. She just burst out laughing, brought out of her shit mood. W, what's that even supposed to mean? The pale-haired master only shrugged in response before giving her a small salute and turning to leave, but his gaze fell on a paper sitting on her desk. Total cost for damages in London. A ridiculous sum was mentioned in it, but that wasn't important. What was important was that it said paid at the end of it. Nicholas cast a glance at the giggling woman and found himself at a loss for words. How could anybody think she was an asshole? I'll accept whatever punishment you've got. His code didn't allow him to say cool and move on. That was the kind of money someone like him would never even see. The grand orders will be starting soon. Chapter 14. Daibi sem void. Rock music blared over the comms built in the metal walls, shaking the fully lit room and disorienting anyone daring enough to enter without thinking about it a ton. 99, 100. Nicholas threw down the 300 kilograms barbell after. Well, an absurd 100 overhead squats, with no sweat on his perfect form and raised his untired hands in victory. Though, he supposed it didn't really feel rewarding when it had taken zero effort. Nicholas rubbed his chin in thought, eyes closed before nodding slowly like one of those Chinese grandmasters, as if he'd gleaned something extremely profound, absurd as ever. It was almost as if he'd forgotten blowing a hole in the skies and temporarily changing the weather moments after arriving in the middle of Antarctica with a casual jab. Actually, what if he tried punching the earth? Fate decided to not leave him alone with his thoughts. The metal door slid aside, drawing his attention to the figure of Scandinavia Pepperoncino, or Pepe, as he insisted Nicholas call him. The eccentric man wore one of his usual outfits, like most of the A-team masters as he'd come to notice. The weirdos seemed to have only one set of clothes that they kept using again and again. They were supposed to be mystic codes or something. Nicholas wanted one. Bill told him they'd make him one based on his origins. Till then, he was going to wear the standard uniform prepared for Arctic incursions. All the others looked like total shit. That strange not-vampire girl had agreed with him. You're still here? Pepe crossed his arms slightly tilting his head. Don't you think it's about time you come out? You've been here for weeks, dear. It was supposed to be a show of concern or something, but Nicholas froze up instead. I'll never get used to this. It was strange, 
Pepe was the strangest damned man he'd met in his whole life. I'll leave when I want to. Sure. Pepe shrugged his hands. But little Hinako seems so lonely, reading books all the time. That's just what she does all the time. Or stalk me. She's a weird old hadash. Never mind. I get it. Nicholas leaned against the wall. It might be one of those you amuse me, mortal situations. She was a Chinese immortal who'd been persecuted all her life. It made sense for her to cling to the few people who didn't hate her for nature. It made even more sense after he'd learnt Xian were branded vampires by the clock tower. I can see the merits of merely following you around. Pepe giggled, shifting his arm a bit. It'd be like following a monk dash. Forget what I said. He slowly licked his lips as his eyes went over the teenager's body, making Nicholas shiver and raise his fists. With a body like that, it'd be offensive to my own standards to say that. Nicholas stepped back dumbfoundedly. S. Stay away from me. He picked up the barbell and took off all the weights from one side, brandishing the exercise gear like a club. Come at me now, bit asterisk H. Nicholas didn't even want to be near the mod dash creature. Bit asterisk H? You know, you'll never be popular with girls with that sort of language. You should be more elegant. Pepe smiled at the pale-haired teenager, visibly amused, though. I suppose you don't car dash. The strangely dressed man hastily ducked, narrowly avoiding a free but permanent face-changing surgery carried out with one of the most sophisticated pieces of technology ever thought up by a human mind. A club. You're hella fast. Nicholas slightly tilted his head. You dodged me before, too. Pepe smirked in response. You're not punching the hardest you can, though, are you, dear? No shit, Sherlock. Nicholas deadpanned. The eccentric master smirked further. Is it because you don't want to disappoint the director? No, it's cause I don't want to keep asterisk asterisk someone. He hadn't even thought it possible, but it happened anyway, Nicholas deadpanned further and I don't want to risk being erased without getting to punch the guy first. Pepe giggled again. Of course, of course. Being around Magi desensitized me a bit. It's normal to not want to keep asterisk asterisk inconvenient people for a civilian. He mostly agreed with that ideology, just Pepe didn't have any reservations about doing it if it served some greater purpose. I fear you'll have to change that outlook if we're to achieve some of our goals. It'll hurt far less that way. David wanted to meet you. Neat. David Semvoid was the most elusive member of the A-team. Nicholas knew his name, but other than that nothing was available. Just that he wasn't the sort to engage in extended conversations, was extremely serious and had apparently appeared out of thin air, with even less information regarding his origins than Nicholas himself. What is human life worth to you? Nicholas emptily stared at the young blonde, purple-eyed man sitting across the table from him. The hell is that supposed to mean? He eyed Kirshteria sitting to the side, more alarmed and tense than he'd ever seen him before. Be quick. The calm, collected, leader of their A-team who had posseed out after drinking a lot of vodka and then later been confused as F asterisk CK when he woke up in the toilets, as if that wasn't the obvious outcome of blacking out at a part, seemed ready to jump into action at a moment's notice. It was weird. I agreed with Barrel Gut's philosophy regarding delight in murder. How do you think I'm going to answer that? Nicholas spoke so gently one wouldn't think he wasn't in the middle of picking up a metal table to cause bodily harm. David jumped back and kicked the metal table flung at him, snapping it in half with an ugly clang, before defensively raising his arms. I see. Think nothing of what I just said. For a moment, a smile flickered across his monotone features. Think of it as a test. Tell me more about yourself. The Chaldean masters were a gathering of freaks and weirdos. Kirshteria placed a hand on Nicholas' shoulder and nodded when the teenager glanced at him, trying to reassure him. No. Nicholas sat back down, crossing his arms. I refuse. For the sake of camaraderie? You don't get to change my mind with your bodicery. Nicholas instantly shot down Kirshteria. Kirshteria coolly retracted his hand. I see, but... What is this bodicery you refer to? I'm unfamiliar with the term. He walked back to his chair as he talked and for a moment, Nicholas wanted to believe the man was sulking. David looked at his watch and turned to leave. That is all the time I had. This has been completely unproductive. Let us converse at another date. 
What the F asterisk CK is wrong with that guy? Nicholas pointed at the leaving Daybit with his thumb. It's like all those I'm cold and emo cause reasons tropes piled on one. Let me guess, he loses his memory each day or wait. I'll do you one better. David Sim void froze in his steps. He has a godlike being watching his every move or acting through him. Nicholas chortled. His back turned to the disoriented but cautious gaze of an alarmed David. I see. Those statements were too close to his actual situation to be jests. David realized he was dealing with something far more capable and of far greater intellect than any human, surpassing even their brightest geniuses, than the simple-minded buffoon Chaldea thought he was. Nicholas Martel was the most dangerous man there. David would have to be careful. Anything done against the man would be noticed instantly. He'd have to be covert, but was it really worth the risk? Who knew how much he'd given away in this meeting? How much would be covert and really escape the man's gaze? Wasn't it just better to act as if nothing was wrong and hope he wasn't a target? Nicholas had key asterisk asterisk Ed Barrel, one of their strongest fighters, with no effort. David could take him, but it would take too much from him to do so. Both fortunately and unfortunately, Nicholas only thought that David was an emo weirdo. I don't think you should be that upset over his moral compass. Kirsteria Wodime offered coolly, completely misunderstanding the cluster of asterisk CK mother of all misunderstandings in the room. P.S. This is a bit wobbly in my head still, but hey, we have the servant summoning next chap. Chapter 15. Annoyed Women. Nicholas eyeballed the brunette, sitting across from him with an uncharacteristic, gentle smile on her face. What you want? For eyes? His mood was already shitty because his sleep had been disturbed, and the way she was smugly looking at him like a toddler was annoying him even more. Maybe it was the fact that almost every room in Chaldea resembled a metal box, sometimes bigger or smaller with screens and furniture, but a metal box nonetheless. Also, the staff was way too amiable. They tried to accommodate him as best they could so he didn't even want to punch them. Nicholas, a little bird told me about you causing trouble in London. And I got my pay cut for it, even got along with David. Right, right. But it gives me the opportunity to show one of my mini ski asterisk asterisk s. Hinako Akuta was being a lot more proactive than usual. It was a good thing, just the wrong time. And I can help you a bit. That's all right, right? Nicholas narrowed his eyes and relaxed back into his chair. Arms crossed. You just read a novel about some therapist and now want to be one? Judging by her widened eyes and slight flinch, he was probably on the mark. W, what makes you think that? I? I'm thousands of years old. No way something like that would cross my mind. Just shut up and let me help you. She averted her gaze in embarrassment, massaging her right arm. You've never had friends, have you? I, I totally have. Besides, Nicholas slightly tilted his head. Isn't therapy supposed to be about talking? How'll it work if I shut up? The teenager didn't feel even slightly bad about messing with the lonely millennia old not vampire who didn't have any living friends aware and accepting of her nature. The hag dash asterisk him asterisk girl pouted, annoyed and embarrassed. What is wrong with you? I don't get many people around me that can tolerate me cause it's weird. It gets me jumpy, Nicholas admitted. He'd punched you multiple times, but she didn't even seem to be bothered by that. Just when her smile softened, Nicholas threw her for another loop. Also, why's the black man gotta have therapy? What? You deadpanned, forgetting her annoyance. Just stop that. What part of you is black? Nicholas slightly smirked. She didn't know he could, before gesturing downwards with his violet eyes. You followed his gaze, not understanding what he was saying at first before her eyes widened in shock. W? Wa? You. I know your name already. Not you. You. You weirdo. You vul. You damn pervert. Nicholas ducked under the book thrown at him. I deserve that. He held up a hand in surrender when the odd-tempered vampy, not vampire, glared daggers at him. A few seconds passed, and you? You didn't know how to start talking again. So she made the genius decision to use what she knew about Nicholas. How'd he do, Buckaroo? The F asterisk A. The F asterisk CK was that? Nicholas chortled, surprised but amused by her words. You hid her red face behind her hands. S shut up. The pale-haired teenager wanted to talk further, 
but was cut off by the door behind him sliding open and a more than usually excited Romani burst through. Nicholas, I got the okay from the director. By the time Yu's embarrassment turned to annoyance at its cause, the two men were already long gone. The Fu Dash, bright light erupted from the magic circle on the ground, making Nicholas involuntarily cover his eyes, even though it hadn't stung even a little bit. He looked at Romani standing off to the side with a clipboard in his hand. Mouth open in surprise, and then at the even more surprised Mash standing beside him. Nicholas didn't know how the fate system worked. He had no interest in how it did so he ignored the doctor's explanation about it after the summoning heroes of Legend part. There was no one else in the hall, mostly because this was also expected to be a failure like most of the tests before it. T, that makes the fourth successfully summoned servant. The doctor unknowingly let classified information slip his gaze fixed on the purple-haired woman with blue eyes cautiously taking in her surroundings which were, surprise, a room of metal. Nicholas narrowed his eyes at her clothing. A low-cut, slit dress and a white cloak that was actually chainmail, ribbons in her hair, gauntlets and blue stockings, stocking-like thingies? Actually, was there nothing under the dress? Oh right, she was also holding a staff with a massive cross at the head. She looked like a Martha. She spoke gently, elegance that seemed almost fake to Nicholas dripping from her mouth. Just Martha, I accept your desire, let us save the world together. Masha's fingers slightly twitched and she turned to the doctor who nodded back. Saint Martha? The one who liberated Tarascon? Erm, it is a bit embarrassing to be spoken of in that matter. But yes, that one just needed a bit of discipline. Wait, wait, hold up just a sec. Nicholas spoke up abruptly holding up a hand with confusion written all over his face. That's supposed to be a saint? He pointed at her and Romani had the faint feeling he knew what was gonna come next. That is what Pesh, Martha, was cut off by a gobsmacked Nicholas. She looks like a two-dollar hoe that hangs in a back alley. Silence descended on the room. The expression of the saint from the first century, blessed by God, froze. W. What? You expect me to believe a saint dresses like that? I, I see. Anyone can miss you dash. She tried to save the situation and Romani pitted her. It appeared not even heroes of legend were exempt from Nicholas' attitude. Uh-huh. Misunderstand. And how much of a donation do I need to make? Nicholas rubbed his hands together. How about a hundred bucks? A are you suggesting? Suddenly. The gentle and kind tone seemed like an act as a vein popped out on Martha's forehead, and she clenched her fists. Why, you little brat? You think I'm a prostitute? How dare you? No one's ever had the guts to say that to my face, Beth Dash. So they said it behind your back? Grr. You. Where did that even come from? My clothes are like this because it's a pain to move around in those clunky robes. Besides, he said it was all right. I'll smash your face in. Who the hell do you? Ink. Martha finally seemed to notice the other people in the room. You? Are. Why were they looking at her with pitiful smiles? They weren't even surprised. I mean. I mean, that's a rude thing to say. She lowered her head, hiding her flushed face behind long purple bangs, and ignored the echoing of footsteps. Air. You shouldn't talk to girls like that. The footsteps stopped, and she saw black shoes enter her vision. You and I can get along. The sheer nonchalance of the words, coupled with the phantom smirk looming above her head, made Martha blow her fuse again and swing her staff. H.M. Humph. How's that? Of course, she lowered her strength right the last second because her actual master was a human. Bad boys would get disciplined. It seemed that last second slow down cost her when all of a sudden her arms started going backwards making her entire body spin with her staff before she reoriented and stopped herself, pleasantly surprised. You trying to throw down? Neat. Martha stared at her master and then down at the weapon in her hands and then at his face. Are you? Like me? How hard can you punch? It almost seemed like she'd forgotten the whole ordeal. Unlike certain other characters who hide their true nature under a whole ton of walls, Martha tries but fails miserably. Her true characters, the easily annoyed and will punch you, part comes out easier. She is also the type to discipline you the old-fashioned way. Feedback, please. Chapter 16. Two of them? 
Olga tapped her fingers against her elbow involuntarily, staring at the ginger-haired doctor standing across from where she was sitting with a bit of nervousness. H. How did it go? It went well. Nicholas succeeded. I don't know how, but the system worked for him. Romani reported honestly. He successfully summoned a heroic spirit contracted to him. He withdrew a page from the clipboard in his hand and placed it down on her table. That was good news. Nicholas had been looking forward to it, and she didn't know how he'd handle failure. She'd never seen him discouraged. But then again, it was hard to discourage someone who just punched his problems before forgetting them completely. The idiot was an idiot, but he was a good guy. He was even refusing to take his pay for several months in hopes that it'd cover the money she spent to fix damages in London. Even though she told him he didn't need to. How? Yeah. Romani scratched the back of his head. Averting his gaze, he punched it. He punched the fate system? Olga deadpanned, facepalming even if she'd expected it. The doctor nodded, yes, claimed it worked most of the time. It did somehow. From his skittish demeanor, Olga surmised even Romani couldn't make heads or tails of how a system that blew up in their face even with rigorous optimization and testing was fixed. Then I suppose you know what comes next. Olga narrowed her eyes pushing away the defeated smile that had started forming on her lips, prepare the rest of the A-team. They weren't in too much of a rush, mostly because it didn't work, but also because the true potential of the system would be realized on missions, not in idle times, but if it was working, hey, this could let the masters get acquainted with their strongest allies and formulate strategies. I did. I mean, we tried. Young Kadok and Hinako were more than willing to test it with Professor Lev overseeing the process. He looked pretty frustrated. Olga narrowed her eyes at the doctor's sudden nervousness. Let me guess. It didn't work. Chaldea's director sighed into her palm at her subordinate's hesitant nod and opened her mouth to placate him. Nicholas told her that was the first step to mending her reputation. But suddenly another thought crossed her mind. If it works for Nicholas, why not just have the contracts transferred after using him to summon them? That was proposed by one of the staff too. She'd have to commend the person who made the proposal. She said she'd answered her master's call and adamantly refused a contract change after meeting the other masters. Romani admitted in a low voice. She even threw a chair at David and called Pepperoncino a vile affront to her lord's design. Then tried to apologize? My God. Olga's eyes widened in shock. There's two of them now? She shot to her feet and shouted at the flinching doctor. Who did he even summon anyway? Saint Martha, from the first century, blessed by the god of the church and vanquisher of a descendant of the Leviathan, Tarask. Romani explained briefly, withdrawing a small note from his clipboard, it's a wonder she accepted Nicholas. He's an atheist? Olga asked, slightly tilting her head. She hadn't really asked because in the pursuit and nature of their goal, things like that held little importance. Is he? Romani shrugged. Duno. Hesitantly, Olga opened her mouth again. W. What did he do? Right the next instant, she regretted her actions. He called her a prostitute. Olga deadpanned. She hadn't seen that coming. She tried to peacefully resolve the matter. He asked her how much she'd cost. Olga clenched her hands and grit her teeth. That idiot. She hit him. He hit her back. Olga calmed down. That was about as she'd expected and it probably dealt some degree of damage too, right? Romani nodded. Aha, uh -huh. and now she admires his disposition? Something about blunt honesty and self-reliance. Also God's gift? They're in a combat simulation right now. Olga Marie and Amusphere pursed her lips. She wanted to smack someone right now. I'll take you to them. Romani stuttered and promptly retreated, terrified of bringing her wrath down on himself from a misstep. As a doctor, he knew that people took out their anger on whatever came up instead of the cause. Seeing her take a slow, firm step his way. Actually, I don't think you need a guide. Romani Archimon, head of Chaldea's medical department, turned around and broke into a full sprint down the well-lit hallway, unashamed of the judging gazes of fellow staff members. He's a master. A master. You know what that means, right? It means he's supposed to be supporting the servants not trying to beat the shit out of more people than them. The damn fool's putting himself in the way of danger. I, isn't it all right? 
Everyone has their own way of fighting. Miss Sakura, Mash inconspicuously eyed the two, arguing members of A-Team, and then returned her attention to the screen above them, her hand cautiously resting against the seat of the bearded staff member managing the simulation. Pieces of rock and earth were strewn about a gra field that shook again and again as Nicholas and St. Martha dismantled a veritable force of dozens of test golems. Somehow they'd gone from being at each other's throats, hitting each other, and then hitting everything else, getting along like there was no animosity between them. The intricacies of how were something Mash didn't understand, never having had a normal life as a lab-grown human for a purpose that the previous director had deemed her unfit for. The two's dislike for each other was replaced by camaraderie faster than she could even process. But well, looking at the combat, Mash realized again why unlike her, someone who was only on the A-team for the convenience it allowed their other members, Nicholas had easily joined in and built relationships with the rest of A-team. While he was outmatched by the rider servant in terms of speed, which of course he was, Mash was half sure Nicholas was, well, punching harder than the rider who was hitting stuff with her hands and staff. Her mount, you know, the reason she was a legend, nowhere in sight. He was a master who could play an active role in combat situations, outclassing all of the A-team in terms of raw power. The lavender-haired girl fixed her glasses and was brought out of her musings by the last of the golems having its head crushed by two fists from either side, crumbling apart in a fist bump. All right, let's go. That was a way so dash. The saint coughed heavily before gently placing a hand on her chest and speaking eloquently. I mean, your fighting capabilities are splendid, master. Yeah, Martha, that one isn't going to work. Nicholas deadpanned at his servant's attempts at maintaining an elegant appearance. The kid might be kinda stupid, but he has a way of dragging people in. The bearded man suddenly spoke, nodding with his arms crossed, and startled Mash who squeaked and stepped back. Oh, sorry. It's all right. Mash waved both of her hands with closed eyes. I'm fine. The young girl found it strange how Nicholas could treat anyone as a close friend but her. Or maybe that was because Nicholas' own personality seemed to almost mirror the servant he summoned.